Hi everyone. I just wanted to preface this episode by saying thank you all so much for listening to my podcast. I've never done anything like this before, so I'm learning episode by episode. I'm open to any opinions on how I can improve the podcast, and I'm always looking for anyone interesting to interview about the world of beekeeping. I'm recording all of my interviews in the Washington County Agricultural Center here in Chipley, Florida. I'm very grateful that they have given me my own room to record in, and they've been very flexible in working around my schedule as I try to manage my apiary and produce this podcast. With that being said, because the Ag Center is an active public building, you will occasionally hear some noises like people coming and going that I cannot control. I apologize if this disturbs your listening experience, but for the time being, this is the best place for me to record interviews. I hope one day I can have my own studio room and better recording equipment to make this podcast the best it can be. Thank you all so much for listening, and let's get to today's episode. Welcome to episode 6 of the Pollination Podcast. Today I'm going to be interviewing State Bee Inspector Jimmy Davis. Thank you, Jimmy Davis, for joining us here on the Pollination Podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me. My name is Jimmy Davis. I'm the bee inspector for the Northwest Florida District. I've been keeping bees since I was about eight years old. Up until I joined the Army at age 19, I spent six years in the Army uh, as a sniper. After returning from the Army, I got back into bees again. Uh, I was a correctional officer for eight years before I had the opportunity to take this job. It's been the best job I've ever had. So you were a, a USDA state bee inspector? You work with not, USDA? not USDA, FDAX, Florida Department of Agriculture. Okay. Bee inspector. Now, do, do does every <coughs> state have a state bee inspector, or is that a Florida-specific thing? Uh, most states do have an apiary program, from my understanding. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. sure there's a few out there that don't, but any, any state that's got a sizable beekeeping as either a hobby or uh, as a commercial thing in the state generally has some sort of apiary program from my understanding. Okay, and what, what exactly is a bee inspector? Uh, bee inspector is just, uh, our, I'll just go over our job. I mean, we, we try to go out and identify pests and diseases and uh, there's also an extension side of our, our job. You know, we obviously try to uh, help beekeepers um, with their problems, uh, within the state now, we have a lot of resources now, just in the past two years or so that's come out, you know, we have a, a lab open now where we can send off samples for uh, virus, bacteria, stuff like that can be, uh, analyzed. That's something that, you know, the commercial beekeepers in the state have really lobbied for for a long time. Yeah. The main thing in the state, as a bee inspector, what we're looking for is American fowl brood. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, that is uh, not a huge problem anymore. Uh, I guess we can attribute that to the Florida State Apiary Inspection Program. You know, we have a kind of a zero tolerance for it. If you have it, you know, and it tests positive, it has to be destroyed. With and That would be with uh, burning it. Yeah, I've heard that. Uh, when I first started beekeeping, uh, I heard you guys burn people's beehives, and everybody was scared. Uh, my my first inspection was, I guess, with your predecessor, An- Andrew Finch. Yes. And he came and inspected, and I was like, please, I hope he doesn't burn my hives, because I didn't really know what America Fowl Brew was. I just heard it was this horrible thing. What what exactly is it? It's a bacterial disease that affects the, the brood in the pupa phase. Um, what makes it so so bad, it's, it's very infectious. Obviously, if a, hon- a colony crashes... From it, uh, if they get robbed out by other colonies, they can pick up the well, the active bacteria and spores and bring it back to the their colony, and it just spreads like wildfire. The spores, uh, we don't. I've heard fifty plus years they can remain in woodware, so that's the dangerous part about it. If you don't nip it in, in the rear end, it, it it can be the gift that keeps on giving. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's so important to be a registered beekeeper. That way, if we do find it. You know, we can, and it, anywhere I can kind of, you know, quarantine off a zone and we can start checking beekeepers around there to make sure it doesn't spread. All right, what are you what are you looking for? And, and is there something like maybe a, uh, like a hobbyist or backyard beekeeper can maybe keep an eye out for if they know they should call you? 
Yes, I mean any any ab, uh, anything abnormal they see in their brood that they don't know what it is. Typically, um, you're going to see it's like I said, it's in the the pupa phase. So after it's capped, but if you see perforated cappings, you should always you know you can take a toothpick or a small stick, um, kind of open the capping up to see what the pupa looks like. You know, it's if it's infected, you know, discoloration. If it's a really bad case, you can it's the term foul brood because it stinks. Um, a lot of times that pupa will actually melt against the side of the cell wall, uh, almost look like nasty brown snot. Mm. And you can take that toothpick or a little stick in there if you see something that looks suspect and you can kind of stir it and then try to string it out. I tell all my beekeepers that if you went in doubt, you know, you can always send me a picture or contact me and I can come in and, and do an inspection just to confirm, you know, we can pull samples. Um, a common misconception is that we'll just come and burn your bees, and that's not yeah. not the case. Unless you elect to do so, I have to send a sample and get a positive. The sample has to come back positive for American fowl brood for us to destroy the colony. Luckily, it's not as common as it used to be before uh, my time. Uh, there used to be, you know, pretty substantial outbreaks from time to time, from my understanding. And luckily, we've been... We don't have that anymore. Yeah, I've heard the cuts talk about it, how they would just dig a hole in the bee yard and something and push them in with like a bulldozer or something and burn them because they were so, like that was decades ago, I think. Yes, I heard from a a mentor and a former inspector of mine, I don't know what year it was, but um, in the past about, I want to say you said it was Wacola County or something like that, they had a big outbreak and they had to bring all the inspectors from the entire state up there and they were taking truckloads of bees out there in the state forest and they had a bulldozer make a big ditch and they were throwing them in there and burning them all wow hundreds of colonies so it's it's definitely a big deal that you don't want to get started but we haven't had any major outbreaks in our area here like in washington county florida no nowhere since i've had this job we haven't had any any outbreaks that i'm aware of i mean there's been onesies and twosies here or there but um it's it's very minimal. Oh, that's good. And now there's also a European fowl brood, right? But that's not as bad. Yeah, uh, European fowl brood uh, attacks the the brood in the larval stage before it's capped over. It has similar symptoms, but it doesn't have a spore. So, therefore, you can clean it up with uh, antibiotics, uh, teramycin, tylosin. You can also requeening can help with that. You know, if you have good hygienic bees, they can generally clean it up. But more often than not, European fowl brood comes from uh, high the stress, whether it's varroa and viruses. As we normally see, a, if we're seeing varroa and viral problems, we generally see European along with it. It seems to kind of hitchhike on those problems. Like I said, if you, t- you can talk to 10 different beekeepers and how they deal with it. So I'm going to tell you, they use antibiotics. Some just use a more hygienic stock. Obviously, if you can keep the mites off your bees, you don't have the viral problems, the stressors to make the problem compound more and more. Okay, well, that's good to know. Yeah, I I know sometimes they can kind of be difficult to differentiate between the two if uh, for like a, you know, maybe a beekeeper is fairly new. But if they have any questions, they should call you or another inspector, right? Yes. And how do, how do they reach you guys if they need to call you? Um, on our website, there's a list of all the inspectors from different districts. It shows the districts on there. You don't have their phone number, their email. So you can just go to the uh, FDAX website, go under apiary inspection, or Google Florida apiary inspection, and it should bring you there. And it'll be the Florida apiary directory. You click on there, and it'll show, depending on where you're located, who your inspector is. Okay, that's great. And what's, um, I know you're looking for fowl brood, obviously, but what's uh, kind of like a day in the life of a bee inspector? Kind of what do you do day to day, typically? Uh, it changes according to the time of the year. We do a multitude of things. Um, while I'm conducting the inspection of the colony, obviously I'm looking for American fowl brood. We also handle the complaint side of it. We always try to make sure the beekeepers are in compliance with the um, best management practices for the state of Florida. That's a form that we make all the beekeepers sign. It covers any property that does not have an ag exemption. Um, you have to comply with that that document. 
And that's what we go off of. If there's ever a complaint with bees, we will obviously go down the list, take pictures if there's a complaint, and say, yeah, the beekeeper's got this or he doesn't have this. If they don't have it, uh, they have 30 days to comply to make it right. Um, if they do, you know, we'll obviously pass it on to the complainant or whoever made the complaint that, hey, the beekeeper's in compliance. There's nothing according to the statues that we can, you know, do about this. Generally, the complaint side, with my experience, has to do with uh, bees normally going to someone's swimming pool or bird water. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, if you're keeping bees, especially in a residential area, that's part of the best management practices is to provide a water source. We also handle all the uh, out-of-state permits for commercial beekeepers uh, going and coming. Um, if they're going to almond pollination, we offer also offer um, fire ant inspections or the RIF inspection, which helps you get through the checkpoint, gives a little more leeway if they find any uh, ants or anything on the truck to get through the checkpoints. You know, we do an extension side. We go to talk at bee club meetings. Um, I try to do most of that in the winter time because obviously I cover seven counties, wow. Northwest Florida. It's um, stay on the road a lot. Yeah, I've heard you guys are stretched pretty thin as far as so many one inspector to so many beekeepers. Yeah, it depends on the county. Some we have, uh, I think it varies throughout the season, obviously, but I. I'm somewhere between 450 and 500 most of the time. Wow. We have districts down south that have around 1,000 beekeepers for one inspector. So, you know, obviously it's more populated down there. The times of the year, yeah, it can get um, kind of hectic. Yeah, I imagine especially around like uh, coming up now, getting ready for uh, the almond pollination. Yes. You go around and inspect all the commercial beekeepers. And, uh, yeah, because we're, we're pretty, st <laughs> pretty stressed out ourselves too uh, right now. I was told that a beekeeper is not responsible for a honeybee that has left the hive, that it's considered a wild animal, and that we're responsible for the beehive itself. Like, that's our livestock. So if somebody, if a bee leaves that hive and stings somebody, say a neighbor in the yard, that'd be like some yellow jacket coming up and stinging that person, and I'm not responsible. Is that true? Well, I'm not a lawyer. That would be obviously something you'd have to handle in court. The way the, the best management practices go, and we do a lot of it, especially in South Florida, you know, if they point the finger at you and say that it's your bees, I have to come out there. It's, it's not whether it's, there's no way obviously I can tell if it was your bees or not. My job is to just go and ensure that you're in compliance with what the state of Florida requires you to do. That's why it's important, and I tell all beekeepers, to make sure their apiaries are in compliance with the best management practices. And like I said, that covers a multitude of things, how many hives you can have on a certain amount of land, having a water source, the, where the bees are at supposed to be fenced in to prevent entry. That can be uh, either a fence or it could be, um, you know, if you have obviously a hedgerow, but it's supposed to have, you know, a gate access to it. If they're within 15 foot of the property line, there's supposed to be a flyway barrier, at least six foot in height, which is, you know, it can be a privacy fence could be a hedge, something like that. As far as it leaving your colony, like I said, I couldn't, like, that would be something that, in a legal sense that I'm not really qualified to answer because we don't handle that. I just, if there's, if somebody complains, whether the bees are stung somebody or whatever, I'm gonna have to go out there and make sure you're in compliance. If there is a stinging incident, I also have to pull samples to ensure that there's no aphronization of the colonies. So that's, you know, it's, kind of a broad question i won't be able to answer every right legally I can't. best best thing as a beekeeper is just to take preventative measures then so you don't find yourself in that situation yes the best management practices was developed by the state the state took over the complaint side because there were city ordinances within the state that didn't allow bee, beekeeping in the city limits that document is really to protect you um if there is a complaint or whatever. So um, I try to tell everybody it's not the state's out to get you. The state's trying to, to protect you. And it's it's a really good good thing to uh, abide by. You guys also, if you think you've made a Tupelo crop, we call you guys too, right, to certify the Tupelo? Yes, I, I come over there. Uh, 
and pull the sample and drive it to Tallahassee to the lab. And then, you know, normally it takes a couple of weeks, they'll send the results back. Uh, not all the districts do that. It's pretty much just me and APO3, the Jeff Pippins area over there around uh, Bluntstown, Bristol area that, you know, does that. And obviously, Tupelo is only made, you know, pretty much in these areas. So Right. So, yeah, we do that too. They can test for Tupelo pollen and gallberry pollen. Other than that, it, the sample is just going to come back other if it's anything else in there because they don't have the ability to test for all pollen types. Right. Um as a as a beekeeper, am I am I like legally required to have that honey sampled, and that it is Tupelo to sell it as Tupelo, or is it is it just like a a trust thing between the customers and the customers and I? My understanding of of the law is that you can sell anything as as pure that honey as long as it's fifty one percent or more. You'd probably get with food safety maybe on that. A lot of people, I think it just helps them with their price, you know, between them and whoever they're selling with. Say hey. This is what I say it is. But I don't know all the legal side of that other than it's got to be 51% or better to be called a certain kind of honey. Most people obviously want it to be, you know, 70 plus percent. I know you had mentioned to me in the past that if you want to get into queen rearing, selling yes. queen bees, that you also have to come and test for, you have to test the drone larva, is that right? Yeah, we just run, uh, generally pull the, the drone pupa. Uh, they just put out some new guidelines that we can pull larvae, and I, I believe it's adult bees as well. But to get your queen certification, there's also a guideline with that. It's queen BMP. If I remember correctly, it's, you got to have at least 60 colonies. That's in a support yard within a quarter of a mile. To obviously saturate the area with drones, um, trying to ensure that you know your Queen stock is mating with European drones. Now, obviously, in this part of Florida, we don't really have an African bee problem, but Central and South Florida, they do. So that's why they came up with that guideline. So we're going to come out and pull samples off of your, uh, generally, your, your drone pupa off your breeders and send it off to make sure they're not Africanized. There's no, there's no gene in there. And then you got to have at least 60 colonies within your support yard. And... Uh, Basically, it's similar to the, the BMR. It's just guidelines that we make queen breeders abide by to ensure they're not selling African genetics. So if a beekeeper wants to start like a queen rearing business next year, they need to contact you guys yes. beforehand? Yes. Okay. You must see a lot of different beekeepers, I'm sure. And I guess you see a lot of non-beekeepers if you're dealing with complaints. Yes. What's prob What would you say is probably the maybe the best part about the job and what's the most difficult part about the job? The best part of the job is obviously helping beekeepers. Like I said, we do a lot of extension on our side, try to train beekeepers, conduct, in, you say, a new beekeeper's inspection or any of beekeeper's inspection. I point out things. I see that they're picking out the brood or um, I'm seeing some sort of viral problem in the brood. We tell the bee, you know, hey, have you treated for mites? You know, this might be something you want to do. Even when it comes down to management, you know, how I, how I do my own colonies. This is what I do, you know, you could try this. Um, the most difficult part would obviously be the complaint side. Um, there's a lot of parts to that. Like I said, normally it has to do with bees going to someone's swimming pool. Anytime you're dealing with people that are irritated about stuff, I guess it can be, you know, a difficult situation. Um, but that, that, that is definitely tough. Sometimes... The public doesn't want to hear the the ruling that you have. You know, if the beekeeper's in compliance or there's nothing you can do about it, they don't like to hear that. And uh, it's just life, you know. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, at least in my, my short experience so far, that most people are pretty receptive to have honeybees around them generally. Like, there's definitely this sort of, like, save the, 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 save the bees vibe. People kind of know they're in trouble and they want to help them and generally seem like they want to support them. Yeah, you still get that one person who's kind of a pain in the butt. And I, I kind of asked that question, too, because I had I actually have a new bee art that we got recently. And there's a lady who has some horses with a water trough across her the fence. And she was a little upset with me the other day because they were in there. It was this summer, I think, when we were going through that drought. They were in there drinking her horse's water. And I don't know. She told me she was deathly allergic. But she managed to catch about six of the honeybees that were around the water and put them in a water bottle and bring them up into the bee yard to show me. And she's like, can you identify these bees? Are these your bees? And I was like, no, ma'am. I've never seen those bees in my life. Those are just some wild honeybees. And 
I do have a, it's right next to a swamp, so there is a water source, but they just decided they wanted some nasty horse water. Yeah, and, sometimes, um, sometimes they get, it could be the water's cleaner. If you have a salt water pool, you might as well hang it up. My parents have one up the road from us. Yeah, they're always in there. They love that salt water. I guess the mineral they want to get in there. It's, you know, it's a tough thing. I tell all beekeepers, obviously, when you're picking locations, not only being in compliance with the beekeeper compliance agreement, but you want to be neighborly. You don't want to irritate the public because it's bad for the industry. Sometimes it's it's a difficult balance there. So I try. I know with my personal bees, I try to keep, you know, most of mine out in ag- agricultural areas and stuff. But I turn out a location just because there is, like, say, horses or something like a stable there because I know what my daggum bees are going to do. They're going to go to the... They love those salt lakes, too. The salt lakes, if they've got animals that lick on those things, and they love uh Sometimes you even see them, like, on, on cow cow and horse crap sometimes. You'll yeah. see them down there. Uh-huh. Yeah, they have... Um, I know the Harris's down here at the hardware store, they have a problem with uh, bees getting into their cattle feed or something they store there, because I guess it's sweet during the winter, so they're trying to, whatever, suck whatever they can out of that sweet feed. Well, you get it too. Some some of the feed, if there's not a lot of pollen, they'll try to collect any of that dust and stuff there, like it's mm-hmm. pollen. So yeah, they can be a nuisance. You have to be really careful where you set them, and sometimes you just can't tell. I mean, the bees can fly someplace you can't see and cause a problem. I mean, we had a particular complaint this year where I mean it was in the middle of nowhere. You know, the bees were flying through the woods going to someone's pool. Mm-hmm. You know, no one really could have guessed. And it was the same thing. There was a drought. So generally there was all these swamps around there. Mm-hmm. All the swamps dried up, so they started going to the swimming pool. So, like I said, it's just a balancing act that you kind of have to do. And as a beekeeper, sometimes I think the best thing to do is, I know spots are hard to find, but just to move your bees and try to appease people because um, it doesn't really help nobody if everyone's mad at beekeepers all around. Yeah. At least maybe go and give them a couple bottles of honey or something. Sometimes and, that'll smooth it over. Yeah, well. I've done that to some yards. I'm like, oh, there's a there's a house next door to this bee yard. I'm just gonna go introduce myself and give her a couple bottles of honey, like from day one. And you know, they they tend to like me after that. I think. Yeah, that changes the whole thing. And just just acting like you care sometimes. Just going over there and saying, hey, well, is there something I can do or we can change up to try to to fix the situation rather than just being. Uh, I guess the term would be be neighborly. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have, um, is there a big difference between when you have to interact with, say, like a backyard beekeeper versus a commercial? Are you sort of doing the same inspection process? Um, doing the same inspection process. The way the, the statute reads is, you know, 10 hives or less, I have to check 100%. And anything over that, it's, it's 5%. So obviously with commercial beekeepers and thousands of colonies, we're not checking every single colony unless we're seeing a problem. And then, you know, we can elect to, to check everything. Right. Generally with the, the hobby beekeepers, it's more, we're doing more extension side of it, trying to teach them anything they may not know. You know, commercial guys for the most part have it figured out. Now they may, may have questions sometimes, you know, if they're having some sort of uh, pest or disease problem, you know, ways they can, they can deal with it. But for the most part, um, They've done got it figured out, you know. So I'm just kind of an asset for them. Um, or they need samples pulled or a permit. Commercial beekeepers, you know, they generally want their, their they're normally easier to get a hold of and, and things like that because, you know, they, they need they need their stuff to be up to date so they can travel out of state and get their permits and everything like that. Uh, sometimes we have some difficulties tracking down. Mm-hmm. Other people, you know, it's not their, their, their bees are not their lives. Yeah. It's, I guess this is the term, you know, and I can understand that. As And as a commercial beekeeper, if you want to ship your bees out of state to any state, do we have to contact you prior to that? Or is that strictly a, a California almond pollination thing? Any state, you should have a, an out-of-state out permit. Now, we only do the fire inspections generally for the, the fire inspections are generally for California. California's got some pretty stringent uh, checkpoints and stuff. Most states don't have that. Um, do you have any tips or advice for new beekeepers who are going to be getting their, their hives this spring? Uh, do your research, especially on you know, pests and diseases and 
you know, obviously Varroa mite is the number one problem we have right now and the viruses they carry. Kind of the biggest problem I see most of the time is beekeepers that don't really do any research. They just think they're going to get a beehive and, and place it out there in their yard and they're never going to mess with it. And those days are over. Um, obviously, if you don't treat for Varroa mites, you won't have bees anymore. They're going to uh, probably within the first year take that colony out. Yeah, and if they're they're buying their first hive, they absolutely have to contact the state bee inspector agency and have you guys come out yes. and register. And they get their own apiary registration number. They get their own apiary registration number. I'm going to go over the. Well, I can even send them the beekeeper compliance agreement. That way, before I get there, they can have everything together. I'm going to go over that during the inspection, and make sure they're in compliance. I guess the other thing would be to you know reach out to your local bee club. You know you don't know what you don't know, and you can read all the books that you want watch all the videos that you want, but things are different depending on your location. Even different parts of Florida are different. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different even over this way versus where I live over towards Crestview. Um, you got some different floral sources. The season started rather a little bit earlier, a little bit later. So you really need to get with, you know, just about every, most counties have a bee club or each each one of our, I know, like my district, there's several different bee clubs you can get. Get one close to you. Go up there, maybe get a mentor. Um, that's what helped me a lot when I was uh, starting out in beekeeping. Is the first three years I did a lot of killing of my bees because I didn't know what I was yeah. doing. Um, but I had some some old timers that I've been doing it for a while. It took me under their wing and, and and taught me a bunch, and it was a huge help. It's a lot easier for most people, I think, to go out there and you can actually see what they're talking about rather than just listening listening to what they're talking about. People ask me this all the time when they buy like their first nuke from me in spring. What medication should they use in this climate to help control varroa mites, knowing that they have to also rotate something? You know, the, obviously it depends on the beekeeper. It's hard for me to recommend anything. I do recommend, especially in the summertime, you know, we're very limited here with our, our warm climate in the summertime, what we can use. Um, the Apivar strip is obviously what I recommend to most beekeepers at the time of the year. I think it's probably the most effective treatment during that time. Um, I have a lot of beekeepers that are successful with oxalic acid, but you better make sure that you have the time to go out and hit them multiple times. And there's so many variables involved with some of these treatments, um, you know, temperature, humidity, and stuff, how effective they are. So I really do tell new beekeepers to learn how to keep bees first. So to start off simple, you know, use eight pavar strips, especially in the summertime. And you can alternate to something else, but try to use that as your silver bullet. And as you learn how to keep your bees alive and all the, you know, you, you learn how to identify things when they're not right, you know, you can branch out into these other, like say, more natural treatments. Obviously, I, you know, you should always read the label. Use the label according to, you know, what it's called for, that's the law. Um, so I can't make any recommendations there. But I can tell you, as long as I've been keeping bees, the labels never led me wrong. That's, that's what I do. I use Apovar on my bees. Um, I do alternate to, to different things, but I can tell you it's been a slow process. Mm -hmm. I, I never jump into all my bees with any certain treatment. I try to take baby steps in there. You know, I have maybe a couple of hives over here in a different yard or something that I... I'll try this treatment to see how it works. And everything's got a strength and strengths and weaknesses. And I tell everyone it's a tool. And as long as you use it, like say, like, you know, formic acid or apigar, if you use it in the temperature range that you're supposed to use it in, in the correct manner, you know, you generally get pretty decent results with it. With that being said, I can tell you from personal experience, to always do you know, an alcohol wash after your treatment um, to ensure that you got the kill that you uh, that you want because it can fool you. I don't care. There's no magic treatment out there. If you went into the treatment with really high mite counts, it's going to take time and probably a little effort to get those mites down to where you're in control. So um, don't don't just blindly treat. Throw you know throw something in there and they're all right. I've I, I've done that. At, times earlier on in my beekeeping career and it came back to bite me in the rear end mm -hmm. so um, this is an expensive hobby slash endeavor yeah and you don't want to make those mistakes
yeah, I definitely am dealing with some of that myself right now. I'm doing, uh, started doing washes after that goldenrod pollen flow hit, and mites doubled, sometimes quadrupled. Uh, got pretty rough. I did not expect that. And honestly, it's the first year I've done alcohol washes that close to winter because I just figured, hey, well, the bees are slowing down. I've already medicated them in the summer. The mites probably aren't bad. I had a, uh, a hard wake-up call. <laughs> That they can that's get the only way you know, though, and you can catch it before it becomes a problem. Yeah. And generally, unfortunately, most of us, we don't learn our lesson until it costs us in our pocketbook. Yeah, you remember those lessons really clearly, though. I'll never forget. You sure as heck better bet. I'll probably be medicating in the fall from now on. Do you ever have to examine less common hive types, like, say, top bar hives or flow hives? Yes, um, top bar and flow hives are pretty common that I inspect them. Everyone to their own. Does it change anything having the different designs, or is it kind of a... Um, really, I mean, the state just requires you to have re removable frames in the colony. You know, the flow hive, you know, for some small beekeepers is, is just easier. They don't have to do all the lifts and pulling the honey, buy extractors. I've never owned one, so I don't really have uh, an opinion on them. Uh, I know the, the top bar hives, some people really like them. I do think it kind of goes against how bees work bees generally work you know up not across you know like a tree trunk right but you know a lot of beekeepers really enjoy that and you know it's supposed to be fun you know not everybody's trying to make money yeah off of honey so um they just want some bees out there so i've seen some pretty nice ones that some beekeepers have built themselves it's it's really cool that's one of the cool parts of my job is i go out there and see I mean, there's some, some beekeepers that are ingenuitive. I mean, they can build all kinds of craziness. They're just building, like, their own unique beehive? Yeah, like top bore style hives and yeah. stuff like that. Um, I want to say I had somebody that had is it a Warren hive, I think it was. It's like they use in Europe. It's got the bigger frames and stuff in it. It was, it was pretty cool to see. I think I knew some uh, Romanian beekeepers. They, they showed me pictures. They were, like, massive frames. They called them daydant frames or something, I think. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. They, they were huge, though. They were, like, double the size of a deep frame or something, easily. Is that is that the same, or maybe they have a different I don't type? know. I know that there used to be, a like, a dated jumbo, jumbo box. If I remember, and that was in a book. There's a book that you can read, like, when I was growing up. You can still buy it. It's called Bees Are My Business. And I think it's Harry Whitecomb is the guy's name. And it's a great book. It's about in the early 1900s, going through like the 40s and 50s. This guy grows up, starts as a boy, gets him a beehive, and he, you know, all the way through college, he's running bees. And he, I think he went to the University of Davis, and they had a queen rearing program. Anyways, he started his own commercial outfit and stuff. But they had these. I don't think they were very popular, um, but they they were called they didn't like jumbo boxes, and they had like 12 or 13 frames, and they're wider. So I've heard of that. I don't know about a, a, a different size frame, but it's possible there were a lot of things that were tried, you know, and yeah, you know, back in those days. And, hmm. uh, they look massive. I was like, man, they. I was like, how do you pull a box of honey if the box is bigger than you? You know, I was like, that's that's nuts. Um, so the last thing I was going to ask you about, because I I did have an old beekeeper tell me, an old bee inspector said that you guys used to do this. I was curious if you still do. Do you monitor the wild beehives? We do um, have bait hives. That's probably what he was talking about. We, you know, we have bait hives generally at the ports. So like I, I, I have them at uh, the Port of Pensacola. I used to have them at the paper mill before it closed at that Panama City, and then I have them at the the Port of Panama City. And we check them. Uh, I try to be within every three weeks. And uh, if we catch swarms in there, pull samples off of them. We generally destroy them because you know you don't know what they're carrying. If, if they possibly did come off the boat, you know. Oh, so if there's a transmission, like, from another country. Yes. Like a disease or something. Yes, we, um, obviously, that's generally how Africanized bees come in is on ports. They come off ships. A lot of invasive critters come in that way. Oh, you know, and we're, we're worried about that, that new mite from uh, Asia, the triple A-lops. Um, so we're constantly testing for that. It's one of the things that we do with, uh, we do surveys every year and stuff and test for that. But when I pull that sample from that swarm or whatever we catch in the swarm trap, we send it to Gainesville and they, they test it for all those. 
they even aphronization and all kinds of stuff. I didn't know they you guys did that. That actually that's actually pretty cool. I always wondered like, because yeah, I had heard Africanized bees came over from a boat, and I just I had no idea there was kind of like a preventative measure by a state agency to stop that. And that's that's really good. Yeah, we try to try to contain it. Um, several other states I think do. I know I talked to the Alabama inspector. I know they do that in Mobile, do the same thing. So. Um, Fortunately, I don't catch that many over here this way. Yeah. In other parts of Florida, I think they catch tons. Every time they go there, their swarm traps are full. But I've only caught swarms two different times. So apparently there's not a lot of bees around where my swarm traps are at. Oh, that's interesting. Well, do you, uh, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think that's about it. Will you just uh, mention again um, where they can contact you guys, like if they want to register their first beehive website or something? Yes, just go to, uh, you can type in uh, FDAX, or Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Apiary Inspection, Google it, and it'll pull up the FDAX website. And it's pretty step-by-step -step going through there. It'll have a directory that you can click on, show your inspector. Generally, if you just contact your inspector, uh, the new system we're doing that's probably the easiest way to contact us i'll enter your information um, and request a firm number from gainesville after that we'll schedule the inspection and either you can pay online or i can collect a payment it's just got to be a check or money order i'll write your receipt and i'll send it all in for you okay well that's uh fantastic information and uh thank you jimmy for joining us today all right well, thanks for having me thanks Thank you so much for joining us today on the Pollination Podcast. I'm Matthew Walker from Walk in the Woods Apiary. We hope we have answered a few of your beekeeping and pollinator questions. Please share your questions and comments to our Facebook page at the Pollination Podcast.